This is Pastor Randy. Thank you for joining me for today's message, A Sheep or a Goat, part of our Love Your Neighbors series. And today's scripture text is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 41 and 44 to 46. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will, will, will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Heavenly Father, bless us as we read your word and speak to our hearts today through that word. We pray that we might be more like Jesus, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Adam Hamilton likes to share a graphic picture of what we Christians should be about by showing one arrow on a horizontal plane going from left to right and saying, this is the way the world is. And then he shows an arrow rising upwards to the right and says this trajectory shows what the world is supposed to be. Jesus would call this higher plane the kingdom of God. This is what we are to strive for. Our job as Christians is to try to close the gap between the way things are and the way things are supposed to be, the way God desires them to be. The higher plane, or kingdom of God, is one where people love their neighbor, practice kindness and compassion, treat one another justly and with mercy. And many of the problems we face in the world today, poverty, injustice, racism, war, division, would be eliminated if we all practiced the simple commandments that Jesus called the greatest commandments, to love God and to love one another as we love ourselves. Every Sunday we pray here at the church the Lord's Prayer and ask that God's will be done, his kingdom come, here on earth as it is in heaven. What does that look like? When our church was founded 150 years ago, the charter members made the following pledge. The Marshall Congregation of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church pledge ourselves to a godly life and discharge of duties of those professing faith in Christ as far as God's grace may enable us. What does a godly life look like, and what duties should we be discharging? Jesus gave something of an answer to that question, I think, in the parable he told near the end of his ministry that we find in Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, the parable of the sheep and the goats that we just read a few moments ago. William Barclay, in his Daily Study Bible commentary, says, This is one of the most vivid parables which Jesus ever spoke, and the lesson of it is crystal clear. The lesson is this, that God will judge us in accordance with our reaction to human need. God's judgment does not depend on the knowledge we have amassed or the fame that we have acquired or the fortune that we have gained, but on the help that we have given. And I might add all the things that Jesus said to the sheep in Matthew 25, the things that he said they did, are summarized by the statement, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's why John wrote in 1 John 3, verse 17 and 18, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Notice that both the sheep and the goats were surprised by Jesus' words. 
No doubt that will truly be the case on that final judgment day. Those who helped others did not think that they were helping Christ and therefore getting extra credit for eternity. They helped because they couldn't stop themselves from helping. It was the natural, instinctive, uncalculating reaction of a loving heart. On the other hand, the goats will be surprised too. Some people will think that they have made the cut when they haven't. Modern Christians disagree, for example, about who Jesus was talking about when he mentioned the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. Did he mean only the Christians? Was he just talking about brothers and sisters in the church? Last week, we touched on this a bit with the story of the Good Samaritan. From the very beginning, people have been asking, who is my neighbor? Who am I required to love? And I told you last time that I interpreted Jesus' parables and teachings to mean love everybody, not just the desirable few. That God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, not just the Jews or the Christians or the people who are easy to love or who agree with us. I believe that the parable of the sheep and the goats makes it clear that Jesus makes the things that we do for others or don't do for them. He takes these things personally. We see this concept illustrated in Proverbs 19.17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for for what they have done. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. It's like saying, whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do for me. Sometimes we get so busy, even busy doing churchy things, that we fail to meet this call of Jesus. Or we make the mistake of seeing our faith as primarily a means to meet our own needs. We see our faith not only as a personal relationship, but a mutually exclusive one. He's my Jesus. We can even become narcissistic in our religion, focusing so much on how Jesus loves me that we forget that love is supposed to transform us so that we can love other people too. Some might mistakenly think that this parable contradicts Paul's teachings that we are saved by faith, not works. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul wrote, For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast." but we sometimes think that we can earn that gift. We mistakenly feel that if we check all the right boxes, we will earn our salvation. And we look at this passage and we say, food pantry, check, we got that one. Prison ministry, check. Clothing ministry, check. And we we think we're doing the things to earn our salvation. All these things are important and all of them are good, but none of them save us. None of them earn our salvation. The parable isn't talking about earning our salvation. Jesus is talking about what it means to look like a real Christian, to be authentic, to be a real follower of Jesus. We are saved by God's grace, and it's his mercy and his love. It's a gift of God that saves us. But that salvation is not just about getting us into heaven. It's about getting heaven into us. And through us, getting heaven into the world around us to change us from the inside out so we live differently in this world in the way we treat our families, our friends, our co-workers, and the needy people that we meet. It's about love for God and for others. All of us wind up on the needy end of this parable sometimes. I will never forget the best lesson I learned from my college professor, Dan Curtis. Dan was the person overseeing my master's thesis work, and one of the requirements of the master's degree was a lengthy written exam. Starting early in the morning, I had been writing essays for probably four hours, and my writing hand had nearly formed into a permanent claw, and I wondered if the indentation where the pencil had rubbed into my finger would be a permanent disfigurement. Stress had seized onto every muscle in my neck and shoulders and arms, There would be an afternoon writing session, much like this one. I was only halfway done. Then Dr. Curtis asked me if I had plans for lunch. I didn't. I told him I'd probably just go over to the student union and grab a hamburger or something. But Dr. Curtis had other plans. He invited me to join him at his home in the country for a home-cooked meal with his family. That time with his family refreshed me and invigorated me so that I was ready to tackle the rest of the exam when I got back. I was hungry, and he gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and he gave me something to drink. I was overwhelmed by stress, and he gave me peace. Dan Curtis is a Christian. He lives his faith, and he lived his faith for me that day. And it's one of the most cherished memories I have of my time at Central Missouri. We all need love and care, and we can all give these things to those who need them. 
William Barclay points out that the things Jesus mentioned in the parable of the sheep and the goats were simple things. Give a hungry person a meal, a thirsty man a drink, a stranger a welcome, a lonely person a visit. These are things that anyone can do. It's not a question of giving away thousands of dollars or writing our names in the annals of history. It's a case of simple human help to people that we meet every day. The things that the sheep did were not difficult things. They didn't require a theology degree or vast Bible knowledge. They were small things that anyone can do. When we love our neighbor, it's in the day-to-day -day things that this love is expressed. You might wonder, why didn't the goats just do this then? Perhaps they weren't motivated by love, but by personal reward. William Barclay says the whole attitude of those who failed to help was, if we had known it was you, we would have gladly helped, but we thought it was only some common man who was not worth helping. Those who help, if they're given praise and thanks and publicity, aren't really helping. It's just selfishness in disguise. And maybe some of the goats were not cruel or calculating, they were just distracted. United Methodist minister James Moore published a little book that my mom and dad used to have on their shelf titled, Yes, Lord, I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. What excuses did the goats have? Well, I know the kinds of excuses that I find myself making. I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have time. I have problems of my own. I'm afraid. They might be dangerous. One of the insights I gained from COVID-19 was that I don't have to busy myself so much. I too often had lived a life dominated by racing from one event on the calendar to another, but suddenly everything came off the calendar, and now I realize I have the ability to control what goes back on. I can leave time to do things for others that I had never seemed to have time for before. And I also found that I spent less money on myself during COVID-19, that I had more money to spend on helping others if I so chose. But loving others is not just a good idea or a feel-good thing for me. It's our responsibility as Christians. 1 John 4, verse 10 says, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And John goes on to write in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. The word Christian literally means little Christ. We are meant to be like Jesus, to do the things he would do, to love others like Jesus would love them. Paul continues his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 10, by saying, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved so that we can do the good that God planned for us all along. I think the unspoken challenge from Jesus in many of his parables is to identify ourselves in his story. And in this case, it's to ask ourselves, which one of these am I? Am I a sheep or a goat? What does it look like to be a sheep? Well, Adam Hamilton suggests that when we love others and help them meet their needs, it might mean that we have less toys so that we can help, help others more. We might live at the top we might not live at the top of our income level so that we can help those who need our help. We spend less on ourselves so that we can spend more on others. We spend less time on things that don't matter so we can spend more time on things that do. He also says it looks like a person who is happier, healthier, and living a more fulfilling life. Christians trying to live out this parable throughout history have made life better for others. Because they love their neighbors, hospitals were built to care for the sick. Soup kitchens and food pantries were opened to feed the hungry. Schools were built to provide the means to make a life for oneself and pull oneself up. Shelters were built for the abused and homes were built for the orphaned. The world was a different place because the church was there. Christians believed it was their calling to do all the good they could to everyone that they could, everywhere that they could, and in all the ways that they could. Will we pick up that challenge and continue that work? The world should be a different place because we are here. Are we committed, like our Cumberland forefathers here in Marshall, to live godly lives and discharge the duties of those who profess to believe in Jesus Christ? Will we be a sheep or a goat? 
One final thought on this Father's Day. In his commentary on this parable, William Barclay points out that inside the idea that when we do these things for the least of these, we do them for God, is the truth that the best way to please a father is to help his child. Since God is our great Heavenly Father, then the way to delight the heart of God is to help his children, our fellow men and women. My wife used to tell our kids that the best present they could ever give her was to get along with each other. Jesus feels the same way, and that's why he taught us that one of the greatest commandments of all is to love your neighbor. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so privileged to be able to call you Father. Grant us your spirit so that we might love all your children as you do, that we might love them as you have loved us. Grant us eyes to see the needs of others and the heart to meet those needs through simple acts of love and kindness, to love them like Jesus. And may all of it be for his glory, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, this is Pastor Randy. Thank you for joining me today. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.